So hello and welcome to another episode of Top 10s. I'm your host for this one, Carl Smallwood, and today we're trialling another episode of our new format. That is where we take a question asked by you, a member of our audience at home, and then task a member of our writing team with answering that question in our usual signature listicle style. And today the question we're answering is, what does spending too much time in space do to a person? And the person responsible for this script is one Ian Forty. Follow them at the social media links found below. But let's crack on, shall we? On June 5th, 2024, astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, which are fantastic names by the way, left the Earth for the International Space Station, or ISS. The mission had been delayed for seven long years thanks to various technical setbacks, too boring and technical to get into here. The length of the mission was to be eight days. Then something happened. And by something, I mean Boeing. The astronauts were using something called the Starliner capsule made by Boeing to get them to and from the ISS, except the capsule had been suffering from numerous technical problems like helium leaks and thruster issues. Boeing has been suffering from problems like this for many years now, such as the doors falling off their planes. The return of the astronauts has been delayed while the capsule is assessed to see if it's safe to use or not. If not, they may not return to the Earth until February of 2025. So everyone is hoping you know, whether it works out for the best, but that could mean that those two astronauts scheduled for just over a week in space could end up spending seven to eight months there. So instead of seven days, it could be just like, you know, seven months. And a long, like, stay in space does come with several side effects, and not all of them are great. Space has no shielding from cosmic radiation the way that the Earth does. Our atmosphere protects us from a hell of a lot, but the galactic cosmic radiation in space can pass right through the spacecraft walls and the soft, squishy human bodies inside of it. A normal stay in space in a shuttle of the ISS is not too dangerous as they're meant to be short-term trips, but the longer someone stays in orbit, the longer they're going to be exposed. It's just one of the many issues they'll have to deal with. When you're not on Earth, it's hard to get access to things the rest of us here on Earth take for granted. It's easy for us to hop onto Amazon and order, say, a microphone, or a, a coffee cup, or a stuffed, fluffy, fuzzy anteater. Well, that's not an option for an astronaut. In their case, it's less frivolous things that they might need, like medicine, food, water, or even oxygen. These are not things that are just lying around up there. And for the record, this is not a frivolous purchase. Look how fluffy it is. Let's put him back. There we go. So imagine something happens to your food supply, your air supply. No, not, not the band that sucks ass, but you know, your actual air supply. Or your water, just as you reach Mars. It takes nine months to get there, so turning around to pick something up is just not an option. Then you have your mental health, which is also a concern that NASA has in regards to astronauts that when they're isolated away from Earth for so long. In the case of the two astronauts stranded on that ASS, it's likely to be worse since their mission was never planned to go on for that long and they were never trained on how to deal with said isolation. But even when it is planned and you know the mission is expected to take that long, astronauts who come back from extended stays in space have had some pretty weird health issues as a result, which we're going to talk about now. There are even a few sci-fi sounding issues that astronauts need to deal with on such missions. And you know, before we get on to those, just if anyone curious about the numbers here, the current US record for an astronaut spending time in space is 371 days, while the Russians have us beat because they had a cosmonaut who spent 437 days in orbit. All that resulted in numerous changes in everything from the astronaut's brain to the bacteria in their stomach. NASA has identified 30 health risks associated with missions in space, so let's dive into a few more closely, shall we? cosmic radiation dangers. Now, it is estimated that on a three-year mission to Mars, astronauts could be bombarded by enough ionizing cosmic radiation to cause serious cellular or DNA damage. So no turning into the Fantastic Four for them. Right now, we have no idea just how much radiation, what kind of radiation, or how damaging all that radiation potentially could be, since nobody has traveled in space for that long. Now, potential side effects could be cancer, infertility, cataracts, and more. And research into potential cosmic radiation exposure has concluded that cancer and degenerative diseases are expected to happen. As in, they're not, you know, unlucky potential side effects of a mission of that length in space. They're going to happen. You are just going to get turbo space cancer. That's just a thing. As for the numbers, it's estimated that an astronaut undertaking such a mission would be exposed to about 50 to 2,000 millisieverts of ionizing radiation, which sounds scary, but what does that actually mean? So, one millisievert is what you'd be expected to get if you got three chest x-rays in a row. 1,000 is enough to cause radiation sickness like vomiting and hemorrhaging and diarrhea. So astronauts on such a mission will be exposed to double that, meaning they get 
double diarrhea in zero gravity in an enclosed space. Which isn't great. And brings on to the next problem that could be isolation and mental health. As if radiation and potentially, you know, crapping out your insides in zero gravity wasn't bad enough, space also wreaks havoc on the mental health of astronauts. Imagine being trapped in a place you literally cannot leave, otherwise you'd just, you know, your body would turn inside out and you'd explode. For months at a time and you are all alone, or worse yet, stuck with people you don't like. How long did it take you to get sick of that roommate you don't talk to anymore? Now imagine you've got to spend three years with them in a sardine can. That smells of farts. Because you know people will be farting up there. Astronauts up in space have been diagnosed with a condition psychologists have dubbed the break-off effect, which is characterised by a sensation of feeling just detached from the Earth, like you're no longer a part of it. And as modern sounding as this sounds, it has been identified as far back as 1950 with high altitude pilots. And some astronauts instead find themselves being attached to the craft they are in instead of the Earth. For example, Alan Shepard, the first American in space, said that when he looked out at the Earth, he felt nothing. He thought it was underwhelming and insignificant, but lied and said that it looked beautiful because he knew that's what everyone on Earth wanted to hear him say. But it's not how he felt. And Shepard lied about his experience, and it's something that astronauts are known to do. Psychologists have noted that astronauts are fearful of expressing their true feelings because they don't want to be considered to be mentally unwell, which would discount them from being an astronaut, the thing they, in many cases, train their entire lives to do. In truth, many of them feel loneliness and disconnection from the Earth and are more interested in their vehicle than the planet they just came from, that built said vehicle. Beyond these unique problems associated with space, astronauts are still subject to the same feelings that anyone on Earth would have if they were stuck in an isolated situation. Anxiety, depression, sadness, and more. The problem is that they often don't have anyone else to talk about it and nowhere to go to change their surroundings. It's that further and deeper into space and far away from everybody they've ever known, loved, and cared about. But that's not all, because we also have the dangers of gravity or the lack of. So back when spaceflight was first being considered, one of the chief things that like NASA was concerned about was how the body would adapt to eating in zero gravity. To this end, like NASA developed many interesting and unique ways to consume food. You know, we've, we've all seen those videos of astronauts like drinking water in space, or you know, we've heard the stories of things like space tang, or that time, I, I think it was Domino's delivered a pizza to space, or there's like space ice cream. But it turns out that eating and drinking were the least of astronauts' concerns, because in a zero gravity environment, the human body suffers from a lot of problems, most notably a loss of bone mineral density. On Earth, your bones, like all your other cells, are constantly changing and growing. They react to the stress that they're under all of the time. The problem is that in space, they're not under that stress anymore, or at least not the majority of it, because gravity isn't putting strain on your bones as they grow and change while you're in space, so they don't need to be as strong. Your bones begin to weaken the longer you are in space, and because there's nothing stressing them out anymore. Which sounds great, right? I'd love to not be stressed out anymore, but apparently your bones need to be stressed. Your bones need anxiety to be strong. Who knew? So after too long in space, your bones become exceptionally weak. That means if you do endure some kind of stress, you're more likely and prone to suffer from breaks and fractures. And when you return to Earth, the stress of gravity can further weaken you. It's not just your bones either. You've got your muscles that have degraded because they're not working against the force of gravity all of the time. There's a fear that after a mission to Mars, an astronaut in their 30s would feel as weak as a person in their 80s when they got off the craft, even after exercising for two hours each and every single day. Which must suck, right? And keep in mind, astronauts are among the fittest people on Earth. Like, you literally need to be super fit. They don't let people in who have problems. We've all seen Gattaca. Or if you haven't, it, it's, it's good, I guess. They, they deal with that. If you can't send people to space if they've got health issues, because they might die and kill everybody. But things would be worse if an astronaut, say, went to Mars, because they'd have to deal with a shift in gravity from their module to the planet itself, and then if they came back to Earth, another shift in gravity again, meaning they have to adjust to three different gravities, and their bodies are just going to have to adapt to that. Or... It, Apparently, not adapt, because, yeah, the body's not very good at adapting to not being in gravity, because it's not really something humans have ever had to deal with until relatively recently. This can cause, in addition to all that bone density loss, it can also cause space motion sickness on top of things like blood pressure issues. Because, yeah, it's really hard for your blood to know where it needs to go when it can't orientate itself. For example, when one Frank Rubio returned to Earth after his 371 days in space, he had to be lifted out of the capsule like a baby bird that fell out of its nest because he simply did not have the strength to do so on his own. And keep in mind, before he went to space, this guy was one of the fittest people, like, you know, in the space program. That's how he became an astronaut. We've all seen the videos, right? 
We've seen the episode of The Simpsons where Barney has to learn to do like backwards handsprings and fly a jetpack. And this dude, he has to be lifted out of the space capsule because space just, it robbed him of his gains. Space gains. And as mentioned, astronauts in space have to exercise for up to two hours each and every single day just to prevent their muscles from atrophying. This isn't to, you know, get stronger, just to prevent their muscles from just atrophying away the way a coma patient's would. And keep in mind, when we say muscle, this also includes the heart, which will also diminish in strength due to the lack of gravity. And astronauts who return from zero gravity have shown an inability to maintain things as simple as their blood pressure when they sit up and have insufficient blood flow to their brain, which you kind of need to think and solve problems and live. Another issue facing astronauts is the fluid pooling behind your eyes, the eyeball flattening out and the swelling of the optic disc. The lack of gravity leads to serious vision issues dubbed space-associated neuroocular syndrome, or SONOS. As an idea of how bad this can get, astronauts on extended missions have had to get glasses with stronger prescriptions as their vision begins to fail them. And these changes can be permanent. So space can permanently change the shape of your eyes. Your eyes. I cannot imagine a sensation more weird and more disconcerting than the feeling of fluid pooling behind your eyes. But we're not done because the other parts of the body can also suffer like the stomach. So stomach bacteria suffers in zero gravity, though the extent to which it does isn't really clear. So after returning to Earth, it's been observed in some astronauts that the amount of helpful stomach bacteria that you see in yogurt adverts has decreased while more pathogenic bacteria has increased. This one needs more study to figure out what is happening and if the potential danger exists. However, it's not the weirdest side effect of being in space. That is, of course, time dilation and aging. Time dilation is a real thing. It's not just something cooked up by Star Trek writers. It's also something that has affected real world astronauts that can be observed with science and the instrumentation used to measure such things. So let's talk about astronaut Scott Kelly, who went to space while his twin brother Mark stayed on Earth. Thanks to time dilation, the gap between the ages increased and Mark aged a little more than Scott did. So the numbers here are extremely insignificant, relatively speaking, because we've not mastered exceptionally fast space travel. And we can't do any of that almost light speed stuff you'd see in fiction. However, it is, like, you know, observable that Mark Kelly is now 5 milliseconds older than his brother Scott compared to when he went to space. Doesn't sound like a lot, but I'd still claim to be, um, uh, you know, the younger brother if there was literally 5 milliseconds difference between us, wouldn't you? So, as Einstein once explained, the closer you get to the speed of light, the slower time goes. Scott Kelly was not going anywhere near the speed of light, relatively speaking, but he was orbiting the Earth at a quite, you know, quite speedy 17,500 miles per hour, which is faster than most of us will ever go in our life, and he was not as close to the gravitational pull of the Earth, so after a year in space, he'd shaved off five milliseconds. If we could, for example, travel a bit faster than that, you know, closer to the speed of light, the difference would be far more significant. Light speed can never be achieved, at least according to physics as we understand it, but what about if we could get close? say 99% close. Well, in that case, a five-year trip to space will result in 36 years passing on Earth. How about even closer than that, say 99.9999999% the speed of light? Well, in that case, one second of travel equals 19.6 hours on Earth, and one month at that speed would mean that 5,876 years had passed on Earth. For long-term space travel, the time dilation would clearly leave the entire world behind. Imagine, for example, Star Trek's five-year mission, if they could achieve near-light speeds, which their warp engines supposedly can do. That five-year mission at warp one would pass while 352,000 years would pass on Earth. Back in our reality, time dilation can still have some curious side effects. Because of how gravity affects time, for example, an astronaut on Mars could live there for 80 years, but die 12 seconds earlier than they would if they lived the exact same 80 years here on Earth. And 12 seconds might not sound like a lot, but there's a lot you can do in 12 seconds. I imagine not being able to do that, because you're on Mars. It's not just your speed that affects time dilation, but as mentioned, gravity as well. That means if you were away from the gravitational pull of a planet and travelling through space at normal speed, that is something below the speed of light, time would still end up moving slower for you than it would for the people of Earth. That's why high orbit satellites age faster on those on Earth closer to the gravitational pull. It's not a significant amount of time, notably, but still, it's something we can observe and it's really, really weird. But the simplified version is more gravity means slower time. On a planet with exceptionally high gravity, or like in the movie Interstellar, where the planet is close to a black hole, time would seem to slow down compared to time here on Earth. 
As bizarre as all of this sounds, and it doesn't seem to make any sense, it's been proven and observed many times over. For example, consider experiments with atomic clocks, which have shown that time does indeed slow down when you move away from a source of gravity, whatever that source happens to be. You can set up two ultra-precise clocks at the exact same time, lined up perfectly down to the microsecond, and the one that travels around the world will come back with a different time displayed. Will time dilation be a big deal for any astronauts in our lifetime? By definition, no, because if it was, so much time will pass on Earth that we'd all be dead and it's their problem, so deal with that one, I suppose. But maybe one day, if we develop an engine capable of near light speed or somehow figure out how to go faster than light speed travel, that could be an issue. Until then, we're just dealing with fractions of seconds. Not exactly the end of the world, but interesting nonetheless. And speaking of all the things you can do in a few seconds, why not leave a like, a comment below for another subject or question you'd like us to answer, or subscribe for more content like this. I've been your host, Cal Smallwood. This has been the mascot of uh, one of the channels I help run, Wiki Weekends, which you can subscribe to below, I hope. It's the link. And, you know, just go out there and have the day that you deserve.